Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to the Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to the Pastor Study. Perhaps you've seen the bumper sticker, Seven Days Without Prayer Makes One W-E-A-K Week. And I, I like to exercise. I don't like to exercise, but I do exercise. If I go for seven days without exercising, I start to feel like a blob. And my experience has been, if I go for a fair amount of time without a good, healthy time alone with God, Spiritually, I start to feel like a blob. So what I want to do in this program and in the next two, it's a three-part series on how did Jesus pray? We're going to look at the longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the Bible, John chapter 17. He prays it the night before he's killed. It's called the high priestly prayer because in it, Jesus intercedes for the church till the end of time, for the future of the church. So if you would, take out your Bible, turn in the New Testament to the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, turn to chapter 17, and let's today in the next two weeks study the longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the Bible. Actually, three full weeks on this, so let's pray. Lord God, we do pray that you would teach us how to pray. And Lord Jesus, you taught us how to pray when you were on earth. And Lord, if there's anyone watching who rarely prays, we would pray that you would help them watch these programs and get into a good regular prayer life. Teach us, Lord, how to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's Thursday. Jesus will be crucified the next morning on Friday, and he prays the high priestly prayer. John chapter 17, verse 1. <clears throat> Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father. Here's the first lesson. Whether literal or figurative, look up. It says in that verse, Jesus looked up when he prayed. Now, you know what the ascension is. After Jesus rose from the dead, uh, he appears to the disciples uh, for a number of days, and then eventually the ascension, Jesus floats up into heaven, and the clouds take him out of the sights of the disciples on earth. It's called the ascension. I went to a liberal Lutheran church once, and the pastor preached, well, of course we know this didn't literally happen, because heaven is not out there somewhere. And I sat there thinking, how do you know? <laughs> and I had a very intelligent professor at seminary, and he said, we don't know where heaven is. Maybe heaven is out in outer space somewhere. But, you know, I don't know if it's literal or figurative, but when Jesus prayed, it says here, he looked up. I often do that, too. I bet you do, too. When you pray, you kind of, God. <laughs> so it's fine to look up. Jesus did. Let's look at verse 1 again. Jesus looked up and said, Father. Here's the next lesson. Jesus taught the fatherhood of God. In the Old Testament, a few places, it talks about God being our Father, but the person who really brought home the teaching of the fatherhood of God was Jesus. So let me ask you the question. Do you see God as your Father, your loving, caring, heavenly Father? I had a woman say to me once, I was raised to believe God is my judge. When I saw that God is my loving, protective Father, it changed everything for me. Well, you know, the Bible does say God is our judge. That's in the Bible. It's true. But the overwhelming picture that Jesus gives us for God is Father. It's beautiful. Don't, don't, don't play with that. Just lovingly accept it. I went to a liberal United Church of Christ worship service a while ago. The woman gets up to lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Our mother and father who art in heaven. And I got angry. That's, that's arrogant. She was correcting Jesus in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus never taught us to pray that way. He taught us to pray our father who art in heaven. That's a beautiful teaching. Don't try to improve upon Jesus Christ. John 17, look at verse 1 again. He prays, Father, 
the hour has come for Jesus' death. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Here's the next lesson. Our central prayer request is, God be glorified. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, the first thing you pray is, hallowed be thy name. In other words, God, may you be glorified in this earth. And God will always be glorified one way or another. For instance, God can be glorified when a nation turns its back on God and then he raises up terrorists to attack that country. That's happened to America. God can be glorified in judgment. Or when a sinner is sorry for his sins and turns to God and God forgives the sinner, God is glorified by showing his mercy. But one way or another, in judgment or in mercy, God will always be glorified. So our main prayer request when you pray is, God, do whatever you have to do to be glorified on our planet. Verse 2, even as you, God, gave him, the Son, Jesus, authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Notice, God doesn't give eternal life to everybody. In that verse, Jesus says, to all whom you have given him. Here's the next lesson. Eternal life is given only to the chosen. A woman that sees our show sent me an email. Pastor Brock, do we have a choice in our salvation or does God choose us? How do you understand Romans 9? And I quoted her John 15 where Jesus says to the disciples, you did not choose me, I chose you. I think I quoted Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 that are very big on, on predestination. And then I quoted Martin Luther who was explaining the third article of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? I believe I cannot by my own reason or strength come to my Lord Jesus Christ and believe in Him, but the Holy Spirit has drawn me, etc., etc. God chooses us. Well, I, I said her that and she sent me back, but it's awfully hard for me to believe that when I have three atheists in my family. But then she added, but maybe they'll still become Christians and then they were chosen, weren't they? And I said, yes, that's the way it works. And listen, I know if you believe that God chooses who's saved, I know that causes some hard questions. But let's be honest, it's what the Bible teaches. Read for yourself Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. And of all the four Gospels, the Gospel that preaches predestination is the Gospel of John. Verse 3. This is eternal life that they, the disciples, may know you, the only true God. Let's do the next lesson. There is only one true God. That's what Jesus says here. Now that's offensive. You mean the Hindu gods are not true? The Buddhist God, the Muslim God, all these other gods, the New Age God in America, all these, all these other gods, they're false? That's what it means. Oh, but that's offensive. Okay, it's what Jesus said. You know, um, years ago I was going on a mission trip to India. I went over early because I wanted to sightsee in Nepal. I got on the tour bus, I thought, to go see a village in Nepal, and the tour driver on the bus is saying, well, now we're going to go see the blood sacrifices to the goddess Kali. I went to the front of the bus, I said, I got on the wrong bus. And, but then I sat down and I thought, maybe I'm supposed to see this. And so I'm sitting next to this rather attractive um, woman lawyer from New York City who was a Catholic, and, and uh, we're talking, and, and uh, when the bus stops, we go down into the valley. Kali is the evil Hindu goddess you want to keep away from your children. So these people cut the, guts, the heads off of goats and chickens, uh, mixed the blood with flowers, and smeared it on this evil-looking Kali statue to keep the, her away from their kids. We come back into the bus, and this Catholic lady says, well, um, why are you here in Kathmandu? And I said, well, I, I'm uh, on my way to a mission trip. Oh, she said, do you really think our religion is superior to theirs? I thought, hello? Did you just see what I saw? And I said, yes, but that's so offensive. All right, but Jesus said there's only one true God. There's not 15 true gods. In, in John 17, Jesus said there's only one true God. Oh, but I'm offended by that. Okay, God's not going to change to make you feel good. You know, I... Uh, 
there's a wonderful, at least it was wonderful, I think it still is, but there's a wonderful Lutheran ministry that through the years has really preached the gospel, given out Christian tracts and everything. And they have a neon cross on top of their building. Well, a couple Lutheran pastors that are on the board of this ministry wanted to take the cross down from the building because it might offend the Muslims. And my friend wrote him a letter and said, you know, his point was, it might save the Muslims too. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says the cross is supposed to offend people. So, you know, the problem in America, the, the American church, we are so concerned about offending nobody that we're also saving nobody. Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, recently spoke to a group of pastors, and his message was, God hates cowards. And he quoted Revelation 21, where it says, cowards will be thrown into the lake of fire. And, and Franklin Graham said, these pastors who won't take a stand against abortion, they won't take a public stand against homosexual marriage because they're afraid of offending people, they won't clearly say that Jesus is the only true God, these pastors are in trouble with God. Jesus says in this verse, there's only one true God. And if you're offended by that, so be it. Look at verse 3. This is the eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Here's the next lesson. Eternal life comes through Jesus Christ. Again, that's offensive. You mean eternal life doesn't come through Buddhism? It doesn't, eternal life doesn't come through my New Age yoga? Eternal life doesn't come through Hinduism and Kali? No. Jesus said, here in this verse, eternal life comes through Jesus Christ. Years ago, back in the late 1800s at the World's Fair, they had something called the Parliament of World Religions. There was a Hindu, a Jew, a Buddhist, a Muslim, and a Christian on stage. Each got to share their religion. The last person to speak to this crowd was the Christian. And he got up and told Shakespeare's tale of Lady Macbeth. Lady Macbeth, at the beginning of the play, commits murder. And the rest of the play, she's washing her hands, saying, out, damaged spot. She thinks there's a spot of blood on her hand. He tells the story, and he turns to the other uh, religious speakers, and he says, gentlemen, which of your religions can get the spot out of Lady Macbeth's hand. His point was there's only one religion that can forgive your sins and give you eternal life. Years ago, I left the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America because it's become very heretical and liberal. Lately, it's been worse than ever. I still read their national magazine called The Lutheran. In the last few, uh, now they're teaching in the Lutheran magazine, everybody goes to heaven. It's nice to believe in Jesus, and we do, but everybody goes to heaven. That's not what Jesus taught. In, Luke, in uh, John 17, Jesus taught eternal life comes through Jesus Christ, period. Let's look at verse 4. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have given me to do. Here's the next lesson. We glorify God when we accomplish the work he gave us to do. Notice, you don't glorify God when you do the work he gave somebody else to do. You glorify God when, he, when you do the specific work he's given you to do. I mean, for instance, Jesus could have done all kinds of good things. He could have started social programs. He could have tried to do political reforms. He could have tried to get rid of all kinds of evil. But that's not what God called him to do. <laughs> and my point is, you can be doing all kinds of good things, but if you're not doing the thing that God called you to do, you're missing your calling. I mean, for instance, if you're a Christian parent and you're doing all kinds of good stuff, but you're neglecting your kids, you're failing because your calling is to be a Christian parent. I mean, I shared this before, I'll share it again. I turned 61 years old two days ago. I never thought I'd be on earth so long. I thought the second coming of Christ was going to be in 1986. Boy, did I miscalculate. But here I am, 61 years old, still on the planet. And you know what my temptation is? <laughs> my temptation is to move to Florida, retire, and do nothing the rest of my life. Now, is that God's will for me? 
You know what? I had a dream. I, told, I said this on the show before, but let me say it again. I had a dream that I quit the Christian ministry, moved to Florida, moved into this little I mean, modular home or whatever, and I had absolutely nothing to do. And in the dream, I heard a voice say, do your calling. My point to you is, every Christian has a specific calling. If you're doing all kinds of good stuff, but you're missing your calling, then you're failing. Look at verse 5. Jesus prays, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself. Now, the question is, is Jesus being an egomaniac when he says, God, glorify me? Because, I mean, for instance, if I was to pray, God, glorify Tom Brock, you'd go, ooh. And why? Because Tom Brock doesn't deserve it. So that would be a dumb thing for me to pray. But when Jesus prays, God, glorify me, it makes sense because Jesus is God. And it's right for God to glorify himself because he's the only one that deserves glory. So um, here's the next lesson. It is right for God to glorify himself. Let me try to explain this. It's an important concept to get. When God glorifies himself, he's not being an egomaniac because there's only one being who deserves all glory and honor. That's God. And, is, and that's good for us. When we glorify God, that's good for us because it's what we were made for. If we start glorifying something other than God, that's when we get hurt. So for our well-being... God tells us to glorify him. Verse 5. Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory, catch this, that I had with you before the world was. Big important lesson. Jesus and the Father had glory before the world. Earlier in the Gospel of John, John chapter 8, Jesus, the disciples say, not the disciples, the Pharisees say, Jesus what do you mean? You're only so many years old, and have you seen our father Abraham, who lived 2000 B.C.? And Jesus said to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. And the Pharisees picked up stones to throw at him, because he, being a man, made himself out to be God. So did you, do you understand this? Before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he was eternally with the Father and the Spirit as God, the one true God for all eternity. Last verse, verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world, the disciples. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Notice what it says there. I've manifested your name to the men you gave me. Here's the last lesson. God manifests himself to the chosen. He doesn't manifest himself to everyone. Jesus says, I manifested you to these people whom you gave me. And again, that sets up the whole question of predestination, God choosing certain people. I don't understand all of that, but our job is not to understand everything in the Bible. Our job is to believe everything in the Bible, even if I don't understand it. So let's wrap this up. Next two weeks also, we're going to talk about the longest prayer that Jesus prayed. And I, here's the main thing I hope you get today. Everybody, and I'm preaching to me too, let's put first things first, and let's put second things second. Don't let your prayer life slip. The most important thing in your life is your relationship with God, your time with God. And if that slips, you'll start to feel like a blob spiritually. Let, you know, I love the, the old saying, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest Christian on his knees. Why don't you and I do something this week? Give the devil a conniption. Get on your knees and spend some good time in prayer this week. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor's study where we now ask Pastor Brock to share with us his knowledge of Scripture and his insights to answer questions we have regarding the Bible, our Lord, and our everyday walk with him. Pastor Brock, can we go a little further into what you've just talked about? You talked about praying to God as your Heavenly Father. What about if a person has had a really bad relationship with their birth father mm -hmm. or their earthly father? <clears throat> Wouldn't this affect their attitude towards God? The Father. I think it can. I think that happened to me. <clears throat> My dad was kind of distant, not involved with our family. And I wonder if I picked up subconsciously that God's kind of like that, that God's there, 
but he's kind of distant from us. And I had to work through some of that stuff. But, you know, um, so yes, I think if you've got a bad father, that can give you some problem trying to rel relate to God as father. But I would say, I mean, uh, Jackie, I remember uh, an elderly pastor saying a little kid came up with tears in his eyes and said, you said God is our father. Well, my dad beats my mother. He hates my brother and I. And if God's a father, you can keep him. And this pastor was smart. He said, well, little boy, what kind of father do, do you wish you had? Oh, he'd spend time with me. He'd be loving. He'd, be, he'd give me things. He'd take me places. And the pastor said, that's God the Father. You kind of just hit the nail on the head as to what I was going to go on to is there are so many children today who are being raised without a father yeah. figure. Yeah. How do they learn that right. God is a heavenly yeah. father? Yeah, and I'll tell you what absolutely not to do. <sighs> Jackie, here's a liberal Lutheran preacher, and I heard her preach. A woman came to me, and she uh, had trouble praying to God. She had a bad father, earthly father. So I said, well, don't pray to God the father, then pray to God the mother. Start praying to God as your mother. I'm thinking, here is a woman who desperately needs a loving father, and this liberal person has just taken God the Father away. Good night. You know, Jackie, who are we to correct Jesus on the Lord's Prayer? That, that to me is just arrogance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Pastor Brock, you hear people say, if God is love and he's a loving God, why does he allow some of the things to happen to our world, like tornadoes or floods mm -hmm. or famine? Mm -hmm. Does yeah. God do those things to wake us up or what? I think he does. Uh, what is it? Is it, oh, is it Amos 3.6? Does calamity come against a city unless the Lord has done it? I, I, where is that verse? I, I wrote it down somewhere. But, um, it's, you know, Jackie, I don't think there are accidents. I think God controls everything. Now, I'm not saying I understand it all. I don't know why my little niece died of a horrible brain tumor at age 11 months and all the pain she had to go through. But, I, and so I don't, I'm not saying I understand it all, but to me it's a comfort to know that God's in control of our sorrows and the devil is not. That's what I guess my thought is too, because when things like this happen that are really major disasters, I'd like to think that God is in control. Yeah. And it's to wake us up to realize right. that things can happen. I mean, Jackie, I don't remember in my lifetime America having so many natural disasters as we've had the last few years. And when you see people on TV say, how could God allow this to happen to me? I'm thinking, have you seen what America has done to God in recent years? How we have just spit in his face with gay marriage, abortion, pornography everywhere on the internet. I mean, what do you mean, how could God do this to us? How could he not do it to us if he loves us and wants to bring us back? Well, and I think too, I, I think back to 9-11. You know, I mean, people said, how did God allow this to happen to the yeah. United States of America? Yeah. You know, we kind of put ourselves on a pedestal that we're yeah. above everybody. No, no. And for the first time, God sent a wake up even to the people of the United States mm -hmm. that you can be yep. attacked. And Jackie, uh, we did a, years ago, we did a show on that. Yep. And I, I made the point, I don't think God just allowed it. I think he sent it. And boy, did I get some angry I people. But you know angry. what? Again, uh, is it Amos 3, 6? Where is the verse? Uh, um, can't, does a calamity come against a city unless the Lord has done it? Yeah. Okay. Um, you said that Christians should worship the only true God and other gods are false. Doesn't that kind of make us seem like we're narrow-minded yeah. if we take that It, it does, but it makes the other people also look narrow-minded. Because, Jackie, they say, well, you Christians are so narrow-minded, you say your way is the only true way. Well, so do they. Their only true way is that all gods work. Well, that's just as much a, a belief system as ours as a system. So they're also just as narrow-minded as we are. They say all gods are true, and you better believe that, or you're a, a, a narrow-minded bigot. Well, that's, that's narrow-minded bigotry, too. <laughs> I think the thing is the attitude. We've got to be humble. Yes, ours is Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God and three persons, is the only true God. And all the other gods are false. Now, we, we humbly hold to that because it's only by grace, God's grace we know that by the Holy Spirit. Okay, you also said that we glorify God when we accomplish what he gave us to do. Mm -hmm. How does a person truly know what God wants he or she to do? Mm -hmm. I think that can be a process. I thought I was going to be a filmmaker. And I went to college to be a filmmaker. And within about a year or two, 
I discovered that's not God's will for me, and he totally turned me around. And I discovered that through prayer and being in Christian fellowship with other people, but it took me a while. So I would just encourage you, if you're not sure what God's will or plan for you is, pray about it, pray about it, talk to other Christians about it. Okay, I guess one question would be, why is God so intent that we glorify him? Mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't that make God seem like he's a little bit self-centered? Uh, you know, again, though, Jackie, if you or I were to try to get, if I was trying to get you to glorify Tom Brock, that's like a cult, you know. A any group that glorifies their leader, that's, that's cult-like because no sinful human leader deserves it. The reason it's not egomania for God to want that is because he's God and he deserves it. He's the only one that deserves it. Okay. Yeah. It says Jesus existed before the world was, was according to John 17. Can you review the Trinity in a minute? <laughs> Here we go. We get, um, we'll leave 13 seconds to say thanks. All right, yeah. Um, everybody, there's one God according to the Bible, not 50 as Hindus teach or thousands. There's only one God, but in God are three equal and eternal persons. God the Father who made us, God the Son, Jesus, who died for us, God the Holy Spirit who lives inside believers. Not three gods. Uh, Muslims think we believe in three gods. No, we believe in one God and three persons. That's the doctrine of the Trinity. That's what the Bible teaches. Yeah. Okay, we've only got 40 seconds left, and we want to talk to you a little bit about our website in case you aren't aware of that. And I'm going to let Tom tell you how we're on two other networks available for people to see besides our website. Yeah. Well, quickly, everybody, if you, uh, if you go to Pastor's Study, two S's, pastorstudy.org, you can see all of our TV shows whenever you want for free. But if you get Direct TV or Dish Network nationally, on the website also, pastorstudy.org, it'll tell you when to see our TV show. You're maybe watching this in Minneapolis, and we're on cable channel 6 and have been for 26 years. But we praise God that enough money came in so we can go national. We ask for your prayers because it is expensive. We'd love to expand and even add more channels around the country. But pray about if the Lord would have you get involved. Go to pastorstudygod.org or see the um, address at the end. And, and please do pray for us. Thank you for watching The Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org. Or write The Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Thank you.